Welcome to um, the ALASC uh, tonight. We are um, going to talk to um, three members of three different roundtables. Um, and uh, we're going to start with Catherine, and then Julie, and then Peter. Um, they've asked that uh, we save our questions until the end, because they have uh, set times to talk. So um, Catherine, if you would like to start. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm joined here uh, by Hannah, who is the secretary of ALASC, and also Debbie, who's going to be helping us with the technical stuff, um, and she's our faculty advisor. Um, OK, so Catherine, when you're ready, take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Hudson. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Student and Student Chapter Outreach Committee for NMRT. Um, ALA is a lot of acronyms, as you're going to learn tonight, um, and NMRT is just kind of the first of those. Um, so what we are is the new members roundtable. Members are new to the profession, new to ALA, or new to both, um, generally with the cutoff being about 10 years worth of experience. Um, and NMRT has been designed to kind of be a gateway to the profession, a pathfinder to the massive organization that is ALA, and kind of a stepping stone to bigger opportunities. Um, so for example, I currently work as a technology guide in a public library, but I was previously doing educational technology at a big university library. And so NMRT has been a fantastic place for me because I'm not really sure where I'm going to land within the library profession still, but I have a place where I can get involved now and not have to wait until I try to figure out which division is best for me, and I've been very grateful for that. Um, so New Members Roundtable has nearly 1,500 members, so it's a pretty substantial group. And our mission is to help those who um, have been around for less than 10 years and become actively involved. Um, and so that's to create opportunities um, through our committees, um, to offer trainings, programs, and networking opportunities to students and new professionals to help you get on your path to being really involved in ALA. One more acronym you're going to be hearing a lot of is SASCO, and that's our Student and Student Chapter Outreach Committee. And this is um, one of the committees within New Members Roundtable that's specifically dedicated to students. And our responsibilities are to act as a liaison between NMRT and the student chapters, um, keep students and the chapters in, um, informed of what we're doing within um, New Members Roundtable. So you'll hear from us about things like Student Chapter of the Year awards, and other opportunities for students. And we'll do a lot of that through our blog, which Debbie has posted in the chat box there, and um, also e-newsletters that will be linked to that blog. And we also try to create opportunities for our students to interact with the New Members Roundtable. So we're not just another acronym and another box to check on your um, ALA form, but really something that you can get involved in. One thing I always like to stress to students is that it is never too early to do this. Um, you can absolutely join ALA, New Members Roundtable, any professional organization you think you might be interested in now. And being a student is one of the best times to explore. Um, you have student chapters, probably more than one on campus. It's a great opportunity to come out and listen to folks um, like us in the field talk about some of the ways that we're involved and also um, some of the opportunities. and. Um, you might have in the future. You have student pricing, which is amazing. Um, it will never be cheaper to be involved in anything than when you're a student. And also uh, the student card. Um, you can kind of play that whenever. Librarians are very willing to talk about what they do and our field and if you say you're a student, we're going to do our best to find time to do that. Um, not everybody, but I'd say the, the good majority of people. And um, it's great to take advantage of that while you're in graduate school. Uh, but particularly student chapters and new members roundtable are great ways to kind of begin your involvement because they are geared so closely to you at this point in your career. Hopefully by now I've kind of talked up all of the great um, aspects of New Members Roundtable and why it's so important to get involved. And so let's talk about how you can actually do that. 
Um, first is to join, um, write the check, get the membership card, do all of that stuff. It shows a lot of commitment to the profession when you can put that on your resume. Um, and roundtables in particular are kind of a, a low stepping, low, low bar to getting involved. Um, we tend to be much less expensive than the bigger divisions and um, tend to do some really cool stuff. In the case of the New Members Roundtable, we also have committees, and students are welcome to volunteer for our committees. I've had students on every single committee I've been on. I was on a committee as a student. And so it's a good opportunity to start learning how these organizations work, getting some leadership experience, um, and, and showing your interest level early in your career. Um, webinars, um, New Members Roundtable does them different. Um, ALA divisions do them, and that's just another way to kind of add to your education. You're going to learn a lot in the classroom, but you're also going to learn a lot out of the classroom. And like I said, library school, great time to do that. Um, New Members Roundtable publishes a peer-reviewed journal and notes, and we'll put out calls for publications a few times a year. Um, that journal has in the past accepted student work, and I was a member of that committee previously, and they highly encourage um, students to submit classwork, um, reworked papers from class, and so forth. Footnotes um, is our newsletter, but also we'll have um, really cool articles about what people are doing in the field. So look for opportunities to contribute there as well. And last but not least, some, um, we have a couple of our big programs, our mentoring program and our resume review program. Um, resume review happens at annual and midwinter conferences, but also is something you can submit to online. And so what that will do will pair you with some of the more experienced folks in the Members Roundtable, and we will take a look at your resume, give you some solid feedback, um, and really help you get that into your ready to go, and you've gotten some extra eyes on it. Again, it's an opportunity where being a student, being new to the profession, play it up, get some help, and really make sure that you're putting something very polished out there. It's a very competitive place. Um, and similarly, mentoring programs, um, we're happy to share our expertise. And so um, if you apply to our mentoring program, we're able to match you with a mentor and um, kind of give you the extra little bit of guidance, um, especially if you're not on campus. It can be really helpful to have just another contact point within the profession. Um, you can also connect with us online. And you don't have to be a member of Numerous Roundtable to do any of this. Um, so we have an active group on Facebook, um, Twitter. We're very active. Our LinkedIn group, and of course, um, NMRTL. And I will actually grab the ALA listserv um, e um, web address and throw it in the chat box at some point. But most of the listservs are actually open, including New Members Roundtable. So ours isn't necessarily one of the most active lists, but you can definitely um, get lots of job postings through there. And um, it's just another good sounding board to ask questions of a whole group of folks. Um, most of the listservs overall are open to join, so um, there's no harm in kind of lurking on a LIDA list or a particular ACRL list if you think you might be interested in something and kind of trying to get a feel for what's happening out there in the profession. And while New Members Roundtable is primarily virtual, you don't have to attend the conferences to be on most of the committees. Um, I've been to one conference since I started um, serving on committees three and a half years ago, so it's really not a requirement. Um, we do, do show up, and usually that includes programs at the conferences, discussion groups, um, student socials, student chapter of the year presentation. Um, a lot of that fun stuff happens there, plus some very um, informal things, usually our socials and the stuff that happens kind of after dinner. Um, at the conference, and then also the resume review services happen in person as well as online. One thing to save the date for, um, less than a week away at this point, we're going to be doing an online hangout with the New Members Roundtable President, Megan Hodge, um, and that's specifically for LIS students. We really would love for you to all show up. Um, we'll be recording it as well because I know schedules can be a little quirky. 
Uh, but that will be at 6 p.m. Pacific next month. Sending out additional information through um, our listserv to your student chapter leaders, but also um, I on the blog, nmrtsasco.wordpress.com, for more of that information, because um, we'll definitely be posting it there closer to the event. And then I just had a few final thoughts I wanted to share um, while I had your attention. And as much as I love New Members Roundtable and it's been fantastic for me, one of the best pieces of advice I got was that ALA is a big place and you, you have to figure out where your home and the organization is. And that's why nights like tonight are so great because you can try to find that place. Um, and no matter what you do, do something. Get involved in some organization, whether it's ALA, a Roundtable, a local organization. Um, no better time to start than right now. It's networking, it's learning, it's professionally developing, and it's good for you. It's good for your career, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as a person as well. That's all I got. All right, next we have um, Julie Winkelstein from the Social Responsibilities Roundtable. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, thanks, Catherine. That was great. Um, let me move it to my slide. Um, so this is, I'm going to be talking about um, CERT or the Social Responsibilities Roundtable. And let's see. I don't know the slides. Okay. So um, I've been a member of CERT since 2008 when I started in a doctoral program at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, before that, I was um, a public librarian for 20 years, but I didn't, I'd never, I don't even think I'd ever heard of CERT. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> um, during the time that I worked, uh, I was in jails, prisons, and family literacy, and also worked in a branch, and so I was familiar with some of the barriers to services that people encounter um, as library users. There are simple ones like fines and fees for people experiencing poverty, and then there's the difficulty of those for, um, people who are experiencing homelessness to get a, if they don't have a permanent address, to get a library card. And I was also familiar with that concept of neutrality, that new, nebulous and not so credible idea that libraries are neutral. So when I read about CERT's history and that CERT is sometimes called the conscience of ALA, I decided I would at least join, since it's free to join for students, just to let you know, and um, then go to one of the meetings. And as Catherine said, I, um, it's really important to find your home, and that's what I was looking for as a place where so that I didn't feel so overwhelmed by ALA. So I went to a meeting. And since then, I've served a term on the CERT Action Council, and I'm also currently on the newsletter editorial board. In addition, I'm active in two of our task forces, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, the Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Task Force, or MLK Task Force, and their Hunger, Homelessness, and Poverty Task Force, or the HHP Task Force. Before I joined CERT, um, I had read Tony Samick's book, which I'm showing here, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility in American Libraries, 1967 to 1974 which gives a really great history of this roundtable and um, what led up to it and the social unrest um, that was going on in, in the libraries and in the world during those years. In the book, I learned um, that it came out of the civil unrest of the 60s, especially the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. I read about the dissension within ALA and the resistance, which um, continues to this day, to the idea that libraries and ALA should be involved in something called issues, in quotation marks based on the premise that there are library issues and then there are non-library issues. At the time, this dissension led to heated debates. There were all-night meetings, and one of the longest ALA membership meetings on record, the longest one was 15 hours over two days. I'm really sorry that I missed this time in our history. Um, in an article um, in Library Journal, John Barry, the editor of Library Journal, said when he was talking about this, um, this unrest, this is a quote from him, um, so incensed were many older members by the seemingly disrespectful demeanor of the young rebels, their contempt for traditional values and authority, their long hair and short skirts, their uninhibited lifestyles, their disdain for the wisdom of their elders. They opposed their very presence at microphones to interrupt the business of the association by the insertion, assertion, insertion of issues. So um, you can see that there's, um, um, that CERT came out of a, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of high passion 
that, that led up to the, the creation of CERT. And let's see, I have numbers on these, but I always forget my numbers. OK. Um, so to give you more about a little bit more about the history, um, it was established in January 1969 at the Atlantic City Midwinter Winter Meeting. And at that time, they established the purpose of it. And these are the bylaws to provide a forum for discussion, to provide for the exchange of information about library activities, to act as a stimulus to ALA and its various units, and to present programs, arrange exhibits, and carry out other appropriate exhibits, activities. Once CERT was established, the first priority was to democratize ALA by having open meetings ballot statements by candidates for president and counselors, opening up membership voting procedures for ALA candidates, changing the composition of the council, roll call votes in the council, and establishing an outreach office, which is what is um, now um, OLOS, which is the uh, Office for Literacy and Outreach Services. So it continues to this day, although personally I think it's underfunded, but it still exists. And social responsibility was also codified. It's um, in the core values of librarianship. And this is from the ALA website. I put that very long URL, URL at the top. And it was originally called uh, 40.1. And there's, they've renumbered them. But as you can see at the bottom, this is um, the foundation of, liter of modern librarianship. They've included social responsibility. But as you can imagine, the intersection of social responsibility and librarianship is a contentious issue. And the question is asked, what does it mean to a librarian to be socially responsible? And this is where CERT comes in, because we believe there are many issues, as I mentioned earlier, that fall into this category. And we continue as, an org as a task force to push for their inclusion, these issues, in a ALA. Many ALA presidents and leaders got their start in CERT, and many continue to be members. But over the years, the membership numbers have gone down. And I think this is partly a reflection of that ALA members have, numbers have gone down. But I also think that it's more difficult to fight for social responsibility when the efforts are less sensational. There's no huge civil rights movement right outside our doors. Issues are less unifying and more obscure in some ways, or harder to really see how they relate. In these days, with Twitter and other social media, we know what people are doing, but it's challenging to see what specifically needs to be done and what the role of libraries is. A good example of this is my research, where I, looked, I look at the role of public libraries in the lives of homeless, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning youth. And so some people might say this is a non-library issue, since it seems to be more related to social services than to libraries. Yet they, these young people use libraries and don't have their needs met. They are community members, and the challenges they face, such as unstable housing, food insecurity, untreated mental illness, hostility related to their gender identity or sexual orientation or housing status, these are all as aspects that relate directly to public libraries. So while some may say this is a non-library issue, um, we insert, and I emphatically believe it is an, a library issue. So just to tell you a little bit about the organization of CERT, there's an action council, and people are elected to serve three-year terms. And this is where this is the body that makes the decisions. They're elected by the CERT membership. Um, there are also five task force. There's the feminist task force. There's the home, hunger, homelessness, and poverty task force that I mentioned earlier. There's the MLK junior task force. Who, um, and they, that I also mentioned, and we work with um, CERT, but we also work with OLOS and other ALA units. There's the International Responsibilities Task Force, which provides a forum for discussion and work on the international dimensions of CERT issues, including organizational alliances. And there's the Rainbow Project Task Force, which Peter uh, is probably going to talk about, because it's a joint project with uh, GLBTRT. And, um, and by the way, GLBTRT came out of CERT in 1999. And the Coretta Scott King Award, which you may have heard of, also came out of CERT. Um, just to show that CERT is sort of like a, a breeding ground <laughs> for, for groups that go on and are, are independent, which is great. It's a really a great place to start. We've Over the years, we've had about 50 affiliate groups since 1969, including six university chapters. Currently, we have Illinois, Oregon, and Washington. Most of them, um, most of these task forces that I'm mentioning on the screen, on this slide, are fairly small. 
And so they offer an absolutely amazing opportunity to get involved and really make a difference. When you go belong to one of these task forces, which is easy, you just join it. You don't have to do anything special. Um, and then you attend and get involved. There's just an just amazing opportunity to really to really do something. For example, one year I'd heard about the Human Library, and um, which is a library where you check out people instead of books. You may have heard of it. And I wanted to do one at ALA use it through CERT. And and they said, sure, go ahead. And there I was, you know, organizing a Human Library, um, being funded by CERT and supporting by them, supported by them. And it was really great. It's a great opportunity. CERT publications include the CERT newsletter, um, which comes out quarterly. And if you haven't seen it, um, this, I recommend taking a look at it. It's a combination of first-person pieces, reports from the task force and affiliates, and reviews and news um, about ALA conferences. They're always looking for contributors. So if you have a topic you'd like to write about, um, email the editor and actually um, Unusually, we actually have, um, a, just this week, I think, have an opening both for a reviews editor and uh, somebody on the um, editorial board because we had two people leaving for various reason, uh, work reasons. And, um, and also, as you can see from this screenshot, um, that you can, there's the newsletter archives, which is amazing to read through because it really gives you an idea of not only the history of CERT, but the history of ALA. There's also the newsletter of the Feminist Task Force, which is called Women in Libraries. And it, they also um, include articles and reviews. And they're also open to contributions. And then the Rainbow Project, um, which is uh, GLBTQ books for children and teens. We also have three email lists, and that's how you uh, find out what's going on. There's a member list called CERT Mem that is um, automatically you get you are enrolled in or whatever you become part of when you join. It's a pretty low traffic email list. Just lets you know um, kind of announcements from ALA. And then there's something called CIRTEC L, which is the official discussion list. And you can join that. And that is um, can get really lively <laughs> depending on what's going on. If there's a lot of heated discussion over something, um, then there's and then all of a sudden it'll die down for a while and then it heats back up again. And then the Action Council itself has a, um, a list, um, an email list. CERT um, also sp sample, uh, sponsors programs every year. Um, some of them are annual events. Some are new ones. Sometimes we are co-sponsors of other programs. And sometimes we initiate the programs ourselves. And then we look for partners. So a, couple, a few examples are the Martin Luther King Jr. Sunrise Breakfast, which is my absolute favorite activity at Midwinter. It's co-sponsored by the Black Caucus of ALA and World Book and then the MLK Task Force and OLOS. I didn't go for years because it's literally a sunrise breakfast. It starts at 6.30 in the morning, which is just like a, a time that even doesn't even want to come out of my lips. It's so early in the morning. But once I started going, I just found it incredible. There's a speaker. There's a call to arms. And then they're singing, which is the best part. You get to everybody joins hands and sings those songs like We Shall Overcome. And it really gives you a feeling of why you're, or for me anyway, why I'm a librarian, why I feel like social responsibility and being a social activist are very much a part of why I'm a librarian. Um, the MLK Task Force is also sponsoring a video tribute, which is um, we're collecting one to two minute videos from librarians and library students that talk about how uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s commitment to equality, peace, nonviolence, justice, hope, freedom, service, civil rights, or human rights, any of those things, how those have played a part in your life or in your work or in your desire to be a librarian in any way. And if you're interested in, um, we have at Midwinter and at Annual, we always have a video camera. But you're also welcome to just send us a video. And if you're interested, you can just send it to me, and I will forward it to the right person. Other examples is Feminist Night Out, which we have every year. It's usually a film and includes the filmmaker and a discussion. We've had a program called Is It Safe to Go Outside? Health Effects of Climate Change and Global Warming. 2011, we had Daniel Ellsberg talk about war and secrecy. In 2013, we had the um, Amelia Bloomer Project author panel. And the Amelia Bloomer uh, Project is part of the Feminist Task Force. Every year, they have a book list of the best feminist books for young readers, ages birth through 18. We also sponsor resolutions. This is something that we um, 
really that we're is very important to us as we try to shape what's happening at ALA. We have a lot of um, some successful ones, a lot of unsuccessful ones, but we keep working at them. Some examples are the USA Patriot Act um, in 2004, the use of torture as a violation of our basic values as librarians, and then 2012 was the voter suppression one. Um, they talked about, uh, you know, we're posing uh, voter ID laws, restrictions on voter registr registration, et cetera. A few unsuccessful ones, we, which we will continue to work on, is 2013, the divestment of holdings in fossil fuel companies. And I noticed that um, the Rockefeller Foundation has divided, decided to divest, and so I'm thinking maybe ALA will reconsider, and maybe that will pass. And then in 2013, I tried to get the Library Bill of Rights um, um, amended so that it's included, it said, a person's right to use a library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, views. That's what it says now. And I wanted to add housing status. And that was not successful. It went to the um, Intellectual Freedom Committee, and they said that that was included in background, which um, I don't know that I agree with. But, um, I want to point out that whether or not these resolutions pass, they create opportunities for conversations and education around these topics. So it's really exciting to have the resolution being talked about. This is just a quote from Arthur Curley, who was later ALA president, who was talking about social responsibility in libraries. He says, the argument is not over the relationship of libraries to non-library problems, but over a definition of the library's role in society that is broad enough in scope to encompass concern with a far greater variety of social, political, and economic factors than has traditionally found a hallowed place on the milestones of library literature. And I think that his statement really sums up the impetus behind the creation of CERT and the ongoing commitment of CERT members. And I want to just end with a few words about being a member. Going to a CERT meeting is like joining a conversation that's been going on for years. A lot has happened. There's a lot of history. But there's always something new to talk about. There's not new, something new to work toward or navigate. I found members of an action council to be passionate and committed and determined and kind people. And I'm really proud to say that I'm part of CERT. We're open to new ideas and new passions. If there's something related to social justice in libraries that's important to you, I recommend attending a meeting and then bringing it up. At CERT, there is a place for everyone who cares deeply about making sure that libraries are socially responsible, however you interpret that. And if you have any thoughts or comments or questions, this is my email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and then we have Peter Coyle from the GLBT Roundtable. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? OK, great. Um, I am here to talk to you about the GLBTRT. And as was said earlier, ALA is a soup of acronyms. Um, GLBT is an acronym for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. Um, and so that is the roundtable that I represent. Um, we are. Uh, the oldest professional organization for GLBT professionals in America. Um, the GLBT RT was founded in 1970. We came out actually of CERT, um, but before we were part of CERT, the roundtable was um, an independent group, and it has its um, its beginnings as the ALA Task Force on Gay Liberation. Uh, it became an official part of ALA later on as, as part of CERT, and then well, we became independent, as Julie said, um, about 20 so years ago. Um, this year we celebrate, well, next year we celebrate our 45th anniversary as a organization. Uh, we currently have approximately 900 members of the roundtable, and our membership is open to anyone regardless of their gender identity or expression. Some people who have been members of ALA for a long time even think, some have I've talked to have thought that you had to be GLB or T to be part of our roundtable, and that is not the case. Um, we welcome everyone to be part of our, our organization. Um, 
fact, some of our, our strongest members are allies. In fact, the roundtable chair this year, Ann, is, a, is not GLB or T, but she is a very strong ally of our causes, and, um, and we're grateful to have her leading the roundtable. We do a lot of things. Um, most of what we do um, takes place in the, the time between conferences. A lot of committees do things. Everything we do is, is based on a committee. We have a number of, of committees um, that do things. We have the membership promotion committee that promotes membership within the round table. Uh, we have a news blog, which um, the address will be up here later on. Um, we have a fundraising committee. Uh, we have book reviews. If you want to review books, we can do that um, as a volunteer basis. Um, but some of the things we do at the conference, we have programs and some workshops. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had training um, by GLSEN on safe spaces. Um, and that was useful for a lot of a lot of school librarians found that very helpful. They could take that back to their school and implement GLSEN training. Uh, GLSEN is a national organization. Um, I think it stands for the Gay Lesbian Education something network. I can't remember what the S stands for. Um, but they provided training on, on how to have a, a safe environment for uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender teens. Um, also, at every conference, um, both midwinter and annual, we have a roundtable social that's usually held on Sunday night that is free and open to anybody. It's always a good time. Um, that Sunday evening of midwinter is when we announce the winners of the adults awards for the Stonewall Book Awards. And then those, uh, the, young, the Young Adult and Children Award is announced Monday morning. Uh, but people come to the social to hear the announcement for the adult winners. We're also participating for the first time in, um, in the Emerging Leader Program. We are hoping to sponsor an Emerging Leader. We have applicants that we are reviewing now, and it will be the first time that the roundtable will sponsor an emerging leader. We're really excited about the prospect of, of having someone from the roundtable be an emerging leader sponsored by the roundtable. We have a lot of resources on the web page, and we also are involved in advocacy. Some of the things that we have done is resolutions through ALA on a number of things. There's the possibility this next year we might have some resolutions about um, INDA and some other legislation um, regarding GLBT issues. Um, a lot of people know us because of the bibliographies that we produce. We have the Rainbow Book List, um, which is joint with CERT. Um, you have to be a member of both CERT and the GLBTRT to be on the, the Rainbow Book List. And that is a, a bibliography of books um, for children and young adults um, about GLBT issues. Then the Over the Rainbow Book List is a similar list, but that's books that are geared for adults. Uh, the Stonewall Book Awards um, is an award, well, it's three awards we give out. Uh, we give out an award and honor books in literature, in nonfiction, and then in children and young adult literature. Um, and those are um, one, of the, one of the ways that I think people know most about the round tables through the, the Stonewall Book Award. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about what we do in the round table. Um, you can connect with us online. The website is glbtrt.ala.org. And if you go there, you can volunteer to be on a committee. Uh, you can learn about the different committees. I just talked about a couple of the main ones, but there are a number of other ones. Um, we're not currently accepting applicants for committees, with the exception of the bibliography committees um, the Rainbow Book List and Over the Rainbow List, as well as the Stonewall Book Award. If you are interested in, in serving on any of those, uh, you can go to the, the website and fill out the committee volunteer form to do that. Uh, you do have to be a member of the roundtable to participate. But joining the roundtable as a student, um, I believe it's only $5. And it's $5 well spent. Um, but we are looking for volunteers for those committees. Um, so if you like to read and want some and have some experience in reviewing, uh, please fill out those that form uh, for those committees. Later on in the year, we'll be having a call for committee members to the rest of the committees. Um, but those committee appointments are a different different calendar. Um, we have the news blog, which is 
a new thing that the roundtable is doing. We used to print and publish a newsletter, um, and then that went to an online PDF. And we've transitioned from a formal monthly, quarterly newsletter to a dynamic blog. Um, news is posted daily, weekly. And you can sign up to receive a once daily digest or a weekly digest so that you don't get inundated. Um, and separately, the reviews and the news used to come together, but we've separated them out because a lot of people look simply for book reviews. And so that link is there. Um, these are all books that are reviewed by members of the roundtable. Uh, we have a, news, uh, a book review chair. She receives a lot of these books from publishers. And then she will mail them to people to review. Or if you have a relationship with a publisher and you have a book that you want to review, you can email her and, um, and set up an arrangement to do that. Um, but we have a couple of students who have reviewed books too. So if you don't think you're quite ready to be on a book award committee or the book lists, um, a good way to start is to review books for the review blog. Um, and then that can get your feet wet. And then later on, you can come to us and say, I have experience reviewing books. And um, that can kind of get you started in that. Um, and I should just mention, a lot of people assume that um, when they join the roundtable, they're never going to get involved because there's hundreds of people applying for things. Um, I joined ALA, and I was a student member for two years. And I joined the roundtable, I think, my, my third year in. And I went to the social and met some people and became friends with them. And they encouraged me to apply. And I thought, well, what the heck, I'll apply to be on the Stonewall Book Awards. I, you know, I put that on the list and, and some other things and didn't really think much of it. Um, but they had a need for someone to be on the committee. And I was picked um, a year out of library school um, as a professional to be on the Stonewall Book Award Committee. And I was pretty amazed. Uh, but it was a, a worthwhile experience, and I was grateful to be able to do that. Um, so just because you're new in the profession, don't don't discount your abilities if you have a desire to do something within the roundtable or within ALA. Go for it, because it is a member-driven organization, and sometimes you might just be the person that fits that need. Um, so don't, don't be discouraged. It is a large organization, but you have skills. And if you um, find it, see a need, definitely go for it. I think that's important. Um, why should you join? Uh, we have lots of networking opportunities. You can get committee experience. If you have a passion for GLBT issues, we definitely need people who are supporters and who want to help us in our mission of providing information and services to our GLBT customers of the library and um, for other issues that, that affect us. Um, so a little, little far in advance, um, you know, it's not quite a year away, about eight months away, but ALA conference, annual conferences in San Francisco. Um, I know you guys are in San Jose and or all over the United States, but if you happen to, to want a trip to California, I think ALA in San Francisco would be a great reason to come. Um, it'll be the 45th anniversary of the roundtable. Um, we're going to, for the first time, have a pre-conference, which is something that the roundtable has never done before. And this will be a paid event in addition to your ALA registration the day before the start of the conference. Our plan is to have a half-day conference on serving GLBT customers. Um, our hope is to have it um, involve a wide variety of library types. So we're hoping that school librarians will find something, and academic librarians, and public librarians, um, and special librarians will be able to come away with information and resources on how to better serve their customers. Um, that Sunday night, we'll have the roundtable social. Um, that is free and open to everybody. It's always a good time. Um, and for the first time, we will not have a Stonewall Book Awards brunch, but it will be a Stonewall Book Awards author program. And it will, instead of being a ticketed paid event, it will be free and open to any ALA attendee. We decided that we wanted members of ALA to be able to participate in the roundtable um, Stonewall Book Awards program to hear from the authors and experience that. Uh, we also found that, you know, honestly, the cost of having a ticketed event um, is expensive. Um, the catering at hotels is quite costly. And it was preventing lots of, of new professionals and students from attending. And we don't want to 
to do that. We want people to be able to participate because it's such a great event to meet the authors and hear their great stories and experience that. So that'll be free. So we hope people will come to that. Um, a highlight of this is that um, it just happens that ALA is also over Pride Weekend. And so we are working with the San Francisco Public Library for the Roundtable and ALA to march in the Pride Parade. So there'll be more information about that um, as it gets closer to San Francisco. Um, I already have lots of ideas about this and very excited about it. I almost want to skip midwinter and go straight to annual because I'm very excited about participating in the Pride Parade with librarians. Um, the last time ALA was in San Francisco was in the 80s or early 90s sometime. And they marched in the parade and were on the cover of the American Library magazine. Um, so we're hoping that that happens again this year. Um, and if coming to conference totally scares you and you're not sure what to do, the Roundtable has a buddy program. So if you were interested in being um, a participant, uh, there is a link on the Roundtable website. You can fill out an application, and we will um, hook you up with a volunteer uh, of the Roundtable who will kind of mentor you and, and help you figure out and guide you throughout ALA. Um, usually, this is an email a couple you know, weeks ahead of time, help you figure out what programs would be good for you. You'll usually meet this buddy for you know, a meal or coffee or whatnot. And um, they kind of shepherd you through the, 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 the mass that is annual conference. Um, we also have these for midwinter as well. Um, but generally, um, it's more successful in, in at annual because we have more people. Um, and people that go to, to midwinter typically have, have committee appointments. But if you're going to be at, at midwinter, which is in Chicago, and you want a buddy, go online and fill out that form. And we'll do our best to, to set you up with someone that can help you with that. Um, and there are a couple of people in the roundtable who have become friends with their buddies. And as their buddies have, have grown into ALA, um, it's kind of given them someone to know and to help. Um, and that's all the questions or the, all the things that I had to, to answer. Um, and if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, I do want to put a plug in. Um, I work for Dallas Public Library as a branch manager. And we are um, expanding our hours this next year. Um, the city council has given us more money. And so if you're looking for a library job, um, if you go to DallasLibrary.org, there's some information on there. We're having um, two waves of hiring. We're going to be hiring a bunch of people this next month and then some more in February. So if you're going to be graduating soon and looking for an, a librarian job and are in Texas or want to come to Texas, um, I'd encourage you to do so. Dallas, um, despite being in Texas, is a, is a pretty progressive city. We have a non-discrimination ordinance for city employees. And the city offers domestic partner benefits, uh, which as you know, someone who was looking for a job when I came to Dallas, um, as a gay man, that was, those were all important things for me. Um, so I just want you guys to know that. So I'll get off my soapbox for the library and answer any questions you guys have. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, Julie and Catherine. Uh, we're going to move on to Q&A now. Um, so if you have a question for any of our presenters tonight, um, you can raise your hand. Um, and we'll, we'll take your, uh, your questions there. And, or we could, you could also type it in the chat box. This is Hannah. Um, I have one question. First, that's so cool that um, ALA SF is at on the same weekend as Pride. That's awesome. Um, but this was a question for you, Peter. Do you have to, for the book reviews, do they have to be for new books, or can they be for um, any LGBT-related books? Thanks, Hannah. Um, generally, it's looking for new books. Um, a lot of times the publishers will send us advanced copies and they're wanting them to be reviewed so people know about them. Um, sometimes there has been a little bit of a delay in reviewing them, but generally it's books within the last year and they try and be, um, I think they try and do books that are, are pretty current. Um, so if it's older than a year, it's possible that the review committee might not want to do that. Um, but if there's a specific title you're interested in reviewing, um, you can email the chair. Her name is Nell Ward. Um, and 
Um, I'll find the link to that page and post that here. But if you have specific questions about specific titles, she would definitely be the person to, to run that by first. All right, I think Sophie is typing. Okay, Sophie wrote, I don't have a question, but wanted to thank all of the speakers. This was so interesting. Okay. I wanted to say something. This is Julie. Um, I'm a member of GLBTRT. And I just wanted to say that I, I love being part of that, and I am an ally. And I've been very, I've been involved, and I've done presentations with them. And I definitely go to the social, and I'm looking forward to the pride parade. So, um, and I, and the news that Peter mentioned, um, that new thing where we get this email that's the, um, the news blog, is really fantastic. It's worth signing up just to get that. Um, it's the really wonderful things that are found. So, thank you, Peter. Welcome, Julie. And let me just say, Julie is um, a very good advocate for the GLBT Roundtable. In fact, one of the things that we just started doing with ALA this last year is having uh, gender-neutral restrooms at conference. And we're hoping to have more of them. Um, but she's been instrumental in kind of getting that going through the Roundtable. Um, and that's, you know, again, a, a member-driven effort. Um, she brought that to us, and that's something that, that we're very grateful that, that she did. And um, so another example that, that ALA is, is only what the members do. Um, and if you have an idea, you know, try and go, go with it, because oftentimes it's a good idea and it'll, it'll happen. Oh, I had a question. Um, I was wondering if... Uh, if your meetings were um, online, over the phone, in person, this is for all the roundtables. Um, um, for so cert, I meet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine. Go. Um, for new members roundtable, we we don't really have official meetings per se, um, but it it seems to be a good balance of online and in person. There's definitely things to do in person, but there's plenty to do online as well. Um, a few committees, like the executive board and such, do meet in person, but in terms of the committees I've served on, I've never gone to an in-person meeting for any of them. So it's, it's all online, and in the case of SASCO, we don't actually meet. We just send a lot of emails. Um, so that's one thing to know about committee work, is you may see uh, an uptick in email, but also an uptick in email that's actually getting things done, we hope. Um, for sure, the, the Action Council of the elected members um, meet in person, although there has been talk over the last couple of years of having virtual meetings also, but we do meet at midwinter and annual. But the, um, the task forces meet, um, are, is, is, is similar to what Catherine just said. There's a lot of email exchange, and when we need to, we'll, we'll all talk together like in a conference call. And we do meet at, at um, midwinter and annual also, but a lot of the work that we, get, we accomplish um, is accomplished, um, you know, virtually through, through email. The GLBTRT um, executive board has a monthly conference call. Uh, it is open to anyone to dial in. Uh, most of the committees meet virtually through email. Um, the only committees that meet at annual in midwinter are the book review, and, I'm sorry, the, the bibliography committees and the Stonewall Book Award Committee. Uh, the Roundtable Executive Board also meets, and we have a membership meeting. Um, and with the exception of the Stonewall Book Award Committee, all the other meetings are open to the public. Um, and, and we also have a, most of what the Roundtable Executive Board does, we do through the Roundtable Listserv. Um, there is one for the general membership, and then there is one for the executive board. Even if you're not on the executive board, you can join as a read-only member, and that can keep you informed about what things we have 
on our plate and what we're trying to do. And anyone can submit an item for our agenda and can participate, um, and that's all on our website. Thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question? I have another question. <laughs> Sorry for dominating the question. But um, uh, this was for is for you, Catherine. I was wondering, you mentioned um, that the Roundtable has webinars. Um, are these like training webinars to um, for different kinds of professional development um, to learn like different things like cataloging or just any things like that? Um, ours tend to be more career focused when we do have them. I'd say they're they're not as often as say the LIDA and ACR LPLA e courses and such. Um, I think it's something that we're looking to do more of. We're also doing our first um, pre-conference program this coming year. So programming is, is still a new thing for the new members roundtable. Um, but we're hoping SASCA will be able to put out a couple of online events at least that kind of talk about getting involved in the association and um, other early career issues that people face. I actually have one more question. Um, this is Ben Books Week, um, and our student chapter has been doing a lot to promote Ben Books. Um, and I was wondering um, what what you all's favorite Ben Books are. That's a really hard question, and actually, um, I'm not sure if I have an answer, but I will generally just comment on the fact that putting together our display has been so hard because all of the good books are checked out all the time. And I would love to put probably The Perks of Being a Wallflower or The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian would be two of my favorites. And I wish I could put them on the display. And I did find a very not display friendly audiobook copy that's just got a plain old boring audiobook cover purchasing a wallflower. But those are those are the two I'm most sad about not having there for it. And I'm glad they're checked out, but I'd also kind of like them to appear for like one day just to make it all pretty and perfect. I can't think of a, a particular, I mean, there's so many books that are banned when you look at the, the list. It's just amazing and why and the reason that they're banned. But um, I do have to agree with Catherine that The Absolute True, true Diary of a Part-Time Indian is one of my favorites. Um, so, uh, but there are a lot of them. I mean, I think of And Tango Makes Three, um, how that's commonly, that's one that's brought up every year that, um, but it's you know um, just one of many many books that uh, you know I don't know anyway there's just so many that I that I read that I guess are that are banned. Yeah, I don't know if I have necessarily a favorite because there are so many good books that have been banned, um, and I don't know if I'd consider this a banned book because it hasn't been banned anymore yet. Um, but Tim Federley's book last year, Better Nate Than Ever. Um, is this really adorable book for middle grade readers. And he is a fabulous presenter. I've heard him talk. And he, he would be great for kids. I mean, very motivational, very, um, very good. And he recently was uninvited to a school because um, his book has just this brief snippet within the first 40 pages where the main character, Nate Foster, who is this 13-year-old-ish you know, kid, says, don't put me in a box. I don't know what I am yet. Um, and he was asked to not come to this school because of this, this book. And it is its most adorable, delightful book. Um, and I think everyone should read it. But um, it, I think it just goes to show what, what people get offended by. And you're never going to make everyone happy. 
Um, but that's that's one of my favorite books, and I, I guess I might consider it banned because it asked not to come to the school to talk. Um, but there are lots, but I'll just I'll just say that one. Thank you. Right. Okay, Last call for questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say this is Julie. I was just going to say that the great thing about a about a band book list and band book week is that if you are at a loss for something to read, it, you always know that's a good place to start. You're you're bound to find a good book if you have a, a list of band, of books that are either challenged or banned. And I'll just put a plug in, um, Barbara. Um, Jones, who's the head of the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom, had an article posted on the Huffington Post today um, about the importance of, of gay characters and books and banned book week. Um, so I would encourage you guys to read that. It's really a great article um, and very timely. All right, last call for questions. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, thank you, Catherine, Julie, and Peter, uh, for your excellent presentations. We really appreciate you taking the time and talking to us here about your roundtables. Um, for those of you who came in late, uh, this has been recorded, so you can pick it up later. Uh, you can contact us, uh, and we'll we'll give you the link. All right. Good night, everyone.